from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased. Joining me, RJ Kitzoriak. RJ, thank you very much for joining me here today. The way, as I was explaining to you before we started, I like my guests to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit more about, you know, your journey what and what you're currently up to. And then we can start taking conversation from there. We're going to talk about health and AI a lot today. I know this for a fact, but before we do this, I will keep the floors to you to introduce yourself. Yes, health and AI is an amazing topic these days. So much interest, as, as you can imagine, as the listeners can imagine. Um, my name is RJ Kedzior. I'm co-founder, COO, CTO of a company called Estenda Solutions. I got our start with a good friend, Drew Lewis, back in 2003, so a little over two decades now. We are an ISO 13485 certified professional services organization focused on data related projects, custom software development, data analytics, and AI. You have data, we can help you. And we work with a mix of large Fortune 50 medical device companies, uh, smaller startups, helping them, you know, develop solutions very much on the patient-focused side. We've never done anything with the billing data or anything like that. I don't find that um, interesting. And that's why I started this company, to you know, work on interesting, challenging projects. You know, my background, I, I came up through the software development ranks. I was lucky in, in the late 80s as personal computing became a thing to have a, a computer at home and I played my fair share of games. I don't get me wrong, I played a lot of games, but I really enjoyed getting into like even programming and what can I do with this technology back then? And I went to college in the early 90s for comp sci. And interestingly, as AI is such a hot topic now, when I was going into college in the early 90s, my goal was to get a PhD in artificial intelligence. Wow. It's one of those things that people forget. It's been around for a while. It's not something that's new. Um, and, and what happened is I got a job offer as I was getting ready to graduate college. And I was like, Hmm, do I take on more debt or go out into the working world and earn a living? So I went out into the working world and, uh, started earning a living, but always had my hand in the areas of, of AI and expert systems and, and things of that nature before we got to, you know, the gen AIs that we were there. But, you know, worked my way through the ranks, worked in various different consulting companies, quickly realized while technology is important, it is much more about the people and the processes and what we do. Um, and that sort of propelled my career over the years to, to make, you know, realize that difference um, and, and how do you apply the technologies to problem solving and challenges. So today, um, you know, 20 years into the, the journey to extend the solutions, which is an amazing, um, you know, mix of those still software development, custom software projects, mm -hmm. but much more heavily focused on, you know, how do we use AI? Um, and lots of questions around, you know, the use of gen AI these days is what everybody's interested in because it's making an, an impact in the world. That's fantastic. Like just out of curiosity, RJ, like, because you mentioned the impact, like, uh, have you decided to focus on the digital health uh, innovation because it, you know it we can see the impact on 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 humans much faster than maybe other fields in 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 technology like what exactly was the motive i mean to to focus on that and also like you know i i like you know what you said about ai i'm going to come to ai but how how have you seen you know this feed specifically digital health evolved, you know, over the last, I would say, 20 years or so. Yeah, yeah, it's been an amazing journey. 
I, I've worked on, you know, prior to Ostenda, developed accounting systems, inventory management systems. Even there was a sort of famous the railroad car scheduling system years ago. I used to work at U.S. Steel, and, and as we were producing that, the, the steel, and I worked in the tubular division, you know, where they made pipes. And, you know, you needed railroad cars in the right place at the right time. Um, and the interesting thing, it was like mainframe programming, so it was it was not an AI driven system, but uh, very, you know, expert rule based of how we get those railroad cars in the right place. Interesting challenges, you know, interesting work. You need those inventory systems, you need those accounting systems. But with digital health, there is that sense of giving back. As we've developed mm -hmm. solutions over the years, and, you know, I've talked to the doctors and nurses, the educators that have used systems we've help develop, you know, there's, there's just a lot of those stories of like, ah, oh, we were using your software and we caught, you know, this particular incident and we're really able to help this patient. You know, so lots of those just sort of individual stories. But then also as we develop these solutions very much, you know, cutting edge innovation kind of thing, they have to go through clinical trials, you know, do they actually work? It's one thing for me and a doctor, you know, um, to say, hey, yeah, this is going to work. You really got to tested. So we also have, you know, PhDs on staff to help drive those clinical trials and actually do the, the you know, proper research um, to make sure that solutions work. And if they don't, then, you know, you adjust them and, and you, you know, take another shot at it. So yeah, it, it, it's been fascinating. I, you know, the second part of your question is, you know, what's, what's changed in, in 20 years? Right. Uh, that, that's probably a whole nother podcast of just what has changed in 20 years. <laughs> It, it boils down to data, you know, so much of our life and what we do is about data. And 20 years ago, it, getting access to the data was a lot more challenging. And there wasn't a lot of data, which was interesting. Healthcare mm -hmm. is, the, you know, I, I think of it as the last industry to really embrace data. They've embraced technology, you know, look at the MRIs and the imaging technology that's out there and just the ability to create new drugs and, and do that research, you know, different methods for surgery and, you know, amazing things in terms of technology that, that the industry has created and, and continues to create. But we're still wrapping our heads around the idea of data and, and how to manage that. So think back to the early 2000s, pre-mobile phone, pre-Facebook, pre facebook pre Pre any of these things kind of thing, which is interesting to hear this say. Um, and, and EMRs were not mandated here in the U.S. They were not frequently used. We were fortunate to get our start working with, you know, military health care and the Veterans Association here in the U.S., which did use uh, electronic medical records. But early on, as we were trying to extract data from those systems, they'd be like, here's this database. Good luck. Um, you know, find what information you did and then, you know, how well was it coded? Today, you know, almost every enterprise health system out there has an EMR, mm -hmm. has data. I'll say it's easier to get the data today, but there's still a lot of challenges. And one of the, the, the big changes in healthcare is the advent of what's called the FHIR protocols, F-H-I-R, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. And it's basically an API to, to boil it down. It's an API to interact with your electronic medical record to get data out of the system. And what that API methodology enables and, and that shift over these last 20 years is so many more developers understand how to use an API to get the data as opposed to your know, methods that were used before then. And, you know, still it's still in use today, but there's also still challenges in, in getting that data. How is it coded? You know, you think of your banking data and you can go anywhere in the world and, and access access your information and, your, and your, your money. It is simpler money, financials, than, you know, healthcare data is, but it is still very much of a challenge of how that data is coded in one system versus another. And the other aspect of data is just the invention of all the different wearables that are on the market now to be able to track information about what's going on in your body. You know, your, your Apple watch now can track, you know, your heart rate and all sorts of metrics or, you know, you can wear a ring, um, or continuous glucose meters, you know, you used to 
finger stick, you know, 20 years ago was the current state of the art for um, helping somebody if they have diabetes understanding their blood glucose. You know, very much mm -hmm. in time. Now you have continuous glucose meters that take a reading every minute. So you really have this fine tuned look at, at what's going on inside of your body and they're just continually innovating now. So if, if anything, doctors, healthcare practitioners are probably getting overwhelmed with the information that, that is available now. All right. So before I jump to the AI, because I think this is the base for the question of the AI, I mean, before I start the discussion about AI and what's happening in, in that, in the field of uh, healthcare, but again, the base is, is the data, as you said, now you mentioned that, you know, maybe it's one of the, uh, verticals, I would, I would say, or like the, the domains that, you know, they have lots of data, right. But, you know, it's, I think maybe probably the healthcare is considered one of the highly, you know, privacy and, you know, governance, um, you know, constrained, uh, uh, you know, vertical in, in the domain of, of digital technology, of course, because, you know, we talk about sensitive data, we talk about, you know, uh, patients, maybe some critical uh, and very private data that it's there. Um, so, Managing patient data, you know, how much it is critical and how much is important for organizations to not only, you know, you before utilizing the data itself, so to really safeguard it and make sure that they are compliant with. And of course, the first thing that comes to mind when you talk healthcare is the HIPAA, right? So yes. Walk me through that, RJ, especially for maybe the folks who are new to, to this field and new to this domain. Yeah, and absolutely. So it starts with privacy of, of data. And if you're in, in the EU, it's you know, GDPR here in the US, the, the FTC has purview over just the general privacy of your data. Um, so you always want to make sure that, that your information is secure, particularly if you have like your billing information, credit card information, you know, here in the U.S. Social Security numbers, kind of, you need to protect that. You first and foremost. Now we made the jump to healthcare in that data set and HIPAA, and here in the U.S., HIPAA is the privacy legislation around protecting health information. Uh, so. I don't know. In in my mind, it's it's not any more difficult than protecting data in other areas. It's just more sensitive. So you do want to be able to you know lock that down. You know, any system you help create, you're going to start with you know a zero based trust system. You know, and and build from the ground up. Um, you know, security is the first thing you got to think about when you're developing the system. Uh, but it's it's about access and, and use of the data. So you know when you look at GDPR, it's the same thing. It's in HIPAA, they're not preventing you from using the data. It's designed to make transparency and let the owner of that data, the patient or the you know just the person in general, when you're talking about GDPR, be aware of how that data is going to be used and consent to that. Um, and, and that's really the core, core of that. And HIPAA, a lot of people historically have used it to be like, oh, I can't give you that data and have used HIPAA as a barrier, um, or as a reason for not sharing information. But that was never the intent of, of the HIPAA legislation. You know, it was, um, to protect the data, but, you know, to promote sharing and, um, make healthcare and the transaction of healthcare easier. Today, more recent legislation has, you know, put penalties in place if you are what you call it information blocking nowadays. So really the government's really trying to push the idea of that information sharing and, and getting that data out in the world and, and making, making it much more usable, um, across everybody. Cause the more that data can be usable, the better off you can be, but yes, the, the privacy, the security protection that information has to be paramount. Um, one of the interesting things I learned, you know, a while ago, you know, you know, in the black market, you think about credit card information or your health card information, health information 
is more valuable the black market than credit card information is. Um, mm -hmm. that you can go after and get drug prescriptions and do all sorts of things with, with that information, but you can't just do it with the credit card information. So yeah, you, you do have to absolutely first protect that. And, and I mentioned, I started, you know, answering your question of referencing the FTC here in the U S that's one of the things is, is we talk to startups, if you're, you know, say create a new ring to measure metrics or a new watch to measure, you know, metrics mm -hmm. in your body, you know. If you're not sharing it with healthcare practitioners, there's no healthcare practitioner or health organization in that picture, HIPAA doesn't come, come into play because HIPAA is first and foremost about that healthcare practitioner. But you are still bound by privacy regulations under the FTC. So I've had these conversations where like, oh, we don't have to worry about privacy. I'm like, yes, you do. You still have to worry about privacy. You still have to worry about security. And I, you're your, the, protect the data of your users. Like if you get breached, you're not going to have happy customers. So, you know, you do have to protect it no matter what. Absolutely. So, and the reason I kept this conversation with this flow, because again, now we're coming to the, let's say one of the main topics uh, that we want to discuss with you, RJ, today, which is uh, AI and generative AI specifically in healthcare. And thank you very much for, I like, you know, to remind people that AI didn't start with chat GPT. <laughs> AI have been around since the 1950s, you yeah. know, when, when they did the first conference ever, right? So in their mouth and, um, but of course what happened, I think in November, 20. 22 forward that was almost two years now yeah. so the world is not same as it was before that because of of course you know open ai's released to the public chat gpt now here's the question rg so first you know what were your impressions when when you start to see you know chat gpt rolling out and having all these use cases and what kind of use cases that you start to think immediately about that can be applied to healthcare. Yeah. yeah. And it is, it's, it's amazing where we've come in, in just two short years. You know, when it, when it first came to market and, and where we are today, it has advanced. It's gotten better multimodal capabilities where you, you can create videos. I think the, Biggest thing in terms of where we are today, um, there was, you know, I'm sure listeners are familiar with Oprah, and I'm sure she's world famous. Oprah had a special on AI and Gen AI and about you know, two weeks ago as we record this kind of thing. If Oprah's talking about it, you know it's a thing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and she had Bill Gates on, you know, founder of Microsoft, another very famous gentleman kind of thing. And Bill Gates said in his lifetime, Generative AI is the most amazing technology he's seen. Over everything he did, over the smartphone, over the internet, generative AI is is the game changer for the market. You know, I, you put it up there, right there with you know the printing press and electricity, um, invention of the internet, you know, smartphones kind of thing. It's it's that game changing. You now we're gonna see a difference in the world. And what's interesting is it's happening faster and faster, which is probably the biggest challenge of, of where we are in, in terms of progress of, of technology. It's the internet made a difference in the world. Smartphones made a difference. Social media have made a difference in the world. Some can argue for the better or worse, you know, kind of thing. So Gen AI is now making an impact on the world. And if we look at healthcare specifically, it gets really interesting and I just love the use cases and the potential for what is possible. So think about a doctor today, nurse, a healthcare practitioner that is taking care of a patient, you know, maybe for 20 years or the individual has, you know, a chronic illness or God forbid cancer, you know, and how are they going to treat that patient? So one, there's just so much medical information now available in this person. And we reference the wearables. There's so much more data and information about what's going on 
with that patient in between office visits. And that's not just when they come to the office, what's their blood pressure, what's their heart rate. You know, when they come into the office, it's like, what's been happening, you know, between those office visits. So AI first can take all of that information and make sense of it and can summarize that information and, and, and provide that, you know, to a physician, to a healthcare practitioner. You know, here in the U.S., we're, we're challenged with our, our private healthcare system where doctors, you know, need to see patients, you know, sometimes it's, you know, they only have seven or eight minutes with a, with a patient. That's not a lot of time. And to drive into an electronic medical record and find the pieces of information that are interesting, it's, it's hard. Um, so let's use the power of AI and the technology, which leads us to the second component of this is, you know, with the advent of the EMR, they were not designed um, to be really usable, not designed to be part of like a patient encounter. They were designed for capturing information and billing purposes. You talk to 10 doctors, if you talk to 10 doctors, 10 of them are going to say, I don't like my EMR. They're just not well liked. Doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals did not get into medicine to work, sit there, and type on a computer. They got there to help people um, to, to make a difference in, in the world. And so, as EMRs have become more prevalent, you know, when you go, I've, I've experienced this, you go to your doctor and they're sitting there talking to you, but, you know, for the most part, they're staring at the computer and typing. You know, some institutions, a lot of places that have brought in like medical scribes to, to help that. So then the doctor's not typing that information. But now in terms of a use case for the generative AI that's proliferating pretty quickly um, in the industry is, is the idea of ambient listening and note taking. And you see it in you know, your teams and your go-to meetings, your Zoom calls kind of thing, all these technologies that are, are doing that. It's listening and transcribing those notes. And so that's, I think, of like the second really quickly um, use of Gen AI that's being realized. And so now you have those two combinations. Gen AI can you know, surface what's information is important. It can listen to the actual you know, conversation and what's interesting, it does things, it makes, you know, it, it's, you know, aware of what's going on. And one of the anecdotal stories that I've heard a couple of times now is just, you know, patient talks about, um, you know, when they go to bed at night, their legs are restless and they have trouble falling asleep. So, you know, they take a shot of whiskey. Mm -hmm. not, the, not the best medical thing to do. Um, but the, the key is that the ambient listening technology doesn't translate that word for word. It translates to patient self-medicates, which is a much more standard accepted terminology. So it, it makes that shift in, in how it, you know, transcribes those notes, you know, it's adding value to, to that conversation. Um, and both of those use cases are very low risk mm -hmm. um, in, in the grand scheme of things, which I think is important as we embark on this journey of using Gen AI, particularly in healthcare because of, of the states, you're dealing with the health and wellness of, of people. So you have those two things happening today, uh, which I find really interesting. I'm waiting, um, you know, and I've said this in, in a couple of different uh, sessions now and in conferences that I've been, you know, talking about. I'm waiting for the combination of those two, two things together to come together where the AI is listening, is aware of the patient's history and is aware of the medical knowledge out there and can surface questions, I think today surface those questions to the physician or the healthcare practitioner so, so that they can ask the patient. You know, so if it's all of a sudden aware of, oh, here's these combination of factors, maybe it means X, here's some questions you should ask the patient to help them out. Because the other aspect of medical knowledge is it's, there's just so much information that is generated every day in the medical field. You cannot keep up with it. Humans cannot keep up with it. So use the powers of technology to do that. Uh, likewise, humans are not perfect. Um, so how can we use the computers to double check and provide additional information 
the patient. So those are the, the biggest use cases out there today that are proliferating, you know, pretty quickly across the industry. You know, plenty of, of uh, I would say, promising use cases, is, uh, uh, you know, and I think, you know, the sky is, is the limit RJ, right? Because um, I, I had like a couple of people on, on the show, you know, and they were all like, you know, in, they are all professional, uh, you know, doctors themselves. And, you know, the, the way they are thinking about it is really fascinating because it's not only about, you know, how it can help in the diagnostics and, for example, in, you know, the kind of what we know about generative AI, but also like empowering people who cannot or they don't have access to proper to proper healthcare system where generative AI, of course, it will not replace a proper doctor, but at least it can do the first first frontier job, I would say, kind of, right? So it's really fascinating to see how far we've came. Um, you know, I've spoken to, to people, you know, also in the pharmaceutical industry and, you know, they're telling me how fast now they can try to get a new drug, you know, for example, for certain diseases. And this is really, you know, like it's, it's a power, right? So, uh, plenty and plenty of, of options that we have here now, um, question to you, do you think that the healthcare industry is ready for this leap. Are they ready for it? Because, I, and I'll, I'll tell you my my theory, RJ, correct me if I'm wrong. Like healthcare is one of the, and it's, it's not nothing wrong with them. I know because we were just discussing about the privacy and all this, but historically healthcare are known to be like kind of like not early adopters, not even like, you know, with the mass, they are like the, people who comes at the end. So <laughs> tell me more. They, they are not the early adopters. And, and I'd love to say they're ready for it. Um, probably not, no. Um, is any industry ready for the impact of Gen AI? I, I, probably not. Um, the challenge in healthcare is the stakes of being wrong are so much bigger. So we all know Gen AI makes up facts from time to time and then they're called hallucinations. Mm -hmm. And, and if you're generating marketing content, eh, not, and you know, something makes it through cause you still, you know, need a human to, to read the materials, you know, or just push it out there into the world. It's, you, you know, it's not that bad. There's been stories of where, you know, a car dealership, you know, has uses you know, Gen AI to talk to customers and, and it agreed to selling a car for like zero dollars and, you know, okay, that's not great, but it's not hurting your life or, you know, or, or maybe having a medical impact. And so healthcare does have to be a little more cautious than other industries. So I understand that idea of hesitation, but we also have to embrace it. There are not enough physicians. There are not enough healthcare practitioners here in the U S if, if the world, you know, um, in the U S we have an obesity crisis. We have a mental health crisis. There are not enough professionals to treat the people that need the help. So we need to use the power of technology to meet the patients where they are to provide that care for, for those, those in need. Technology, as we know, is very scalable. So, you know, and there are people creating, you know, mental health systems to, to help with all sorts of issues, but not even just help identify, you know, this, we were talking about, you know, the idea of ambient listening, various different companies are creating AI solutions, not, for, not strictly gen AI, but AI and machine learning systems that can listen to how you talk can listen to your cough to diagnose tuberculosis, can listen to just your con this conversation and be like, hey, are you okay? Are you depressed? Can start, can look at that type of information 
to better understand where you are in your life. And okay, now there's a point of in, inflection, um, you know, hey, you should go, you know, seek out a medical professional. Or if you are under a physician's care, it can be a note to the physician to be like, hey, next time you see this patient, or maybe you should, you know, reach out to this patient and, and check in on them. The, if you can monitor people much more closely like that in a very beneficial way. So yes, I think the the healthcare industry needs to embrace this technology from that aspect, from the aspect of just making mistakes and doing better. You know, there, there's a lot of talk about ethics. Ethics is interesting in, right. well, in healthcare. And what I, what I find interesting is so many organizations are creating ethics, ethical guidelines around AI. I'm like, well, those ethical guidelines exist already. Why do we need another set of ethical guidelines? The physicians are famous for first, do no harm. You know, it's like, there's the core of your ethical guideline. You don't need another thing to like tell you that. It's like, do no harm. Um, but I flipped that on that, its head. Do we have an ethical requirement to use this technology? to help those people in need because we can't reach out to all of them. We know we can provide the necessary care to all the people that need it. So I, I like flipping it on his head and saying, we need to embrace this technology. We need to use it and get it out there. hundred percent. I agree with you on, on, on this RJ, because it's not like a kind of a luxury product that, uh, yeah, we can use it. Like we can, you know, do something good. Like it's not like kind of a cosmetic operation that they're going to, we're going to apply for someone to look better. It's, it's something that maybe it's going to say that maybe we are sure because we started to hear these stories. We start to see these, you know, proofs that using AI machine learning, not only generative AI, generative AI is, yeah, it's one part of it, like, which can, you know, in between, <laughs> just between like Brex, I would say, talk to people in a sense, give them information. Of course, they need to, as you mentioned, take care from the hallucinations that can, you know, happen, which is, by the way, you know, people are working, you know, people in the AI domain are working hardly on, you know, reducing the amount of hallucination that can that can happen. So this is work in progress. But yeah, I agree with you, RJ, like we, we need to embrace it and utilize it because, and by the way, it's not only a U.S. problem, just, you know, because I have a global audience. So I think, and not I think, I also, again, like I, I, we discussed this on the show, uh, it's a global epidemic, which is stress, which is, you know, uh, people feeling overwhelmed, uh, mental health. Uh, all these are like the global epidemics, as we can call them. And AI is indeed one of you know the many technologies that we might be able to use to help us somehow. Of course, we're gonna see how things are gonna uh, progress, but I'm I'm positive on on this part. Now, you mentioned something you know just a couple of minutes ago, RJ, regarding the we, we were, when we were discussing you know the uh, the data and the privacy. But I want to ask you from a different pers perspective, the wearable devices, right? Mm -hmm. So. So we know about the ring, we know about, you know, like many products So something that can track our sleep, some, they track the blood, some, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, what are, in your opinion, the next big things in, in, in that domain, especially, you know, because we're talking about sensors that kind of, you know, take the data, record it, and then feed it to the AI, right? So what are some of the trends you're seeing currently in the wearable uh, device um, technology? Well, interesting. I, I can tell you the the new thing that I just used for the first time today, um, a little bit unusual. I, I raced triathlons and, you know, so I jumped in the swimming pool today, got a pair of goggles, <laughs> um, that have a built-in heart rate sensor and have a display on the lens of the goggles so I can see my heart rate in real time and it counts my stroke. So it's very uh, physical activity exercise oriented, but to be able to sit there and swim laps for half an hour and it's showing me my heart rate, 
tracking my laps, tracking my strokes, you know, per, you know, 25 meters that I was swimming kind of thing, tracking my head angle, you know, so that I had better form was just, you know, as a, a triathlete it was just amazing for me to, to see that, um, it definitely was distracting something I'm gonna have to get used to, to seeing that information. But it's just, it demonstrates the proliferation of this technology and how it can be used in, in different areas to better understand what's going on. Uh, CGM, continuous glucose monitors have been around for, you know, a while now. Um, but what's interesting about those is various different manufacturers have now created versions for people without diabetes. So normal people without diabetes can wear these devices and better understand what happens in terms of their blood glucose in their body as an educational component. So, you know, I'm fortunate I don't have diabetes, but, you know, I wore one of these a couple of weeks ago to see what the impact of food and different foods that I ate um, and, and even, you know, the order of how you eat your foods can impact your, your blood glucose. So I think it's a very interesting educational tool, you know, for those people that are pre-diabetic, you know, particularly type two, that if you do eat better, if you move more, and I like saying move more as opposed to exercise, because you don't have to exercise, you move more walking, you know, so there there's, if you eat and you go for a walk after you eat, your blood glucose will not go up as high. So you are better off. And I was able to run this simple experiment as I was wearing this stuff. You know, one night I ate the, the, a meal and didn't, you know, go for a walk afterwards. The next night I ate the same meal and went for a walk and was able to see the difference in my blood glucose. Um, so it's fascinating. Whereas I know that, you know, scientifically, like this is the, the impact of that walk. It was fascinating just to see it in real life, in my body, in that, in that, um, moment. So that, that's an awesome capability that I think more and more people are going to have access to, to understand the impact of food in terms of, you know, capturing the biometric data, you know, with the wearables, we can you know, the heart rate and all, all sorts of things now are, are capturable. Nutrition is sort of like that last piece, you know, there's dozens of different, if not hundreds of applications for people to like track what they eat and they're getting more advanced where you can take a picture and then that, you know, the, the technology in a lot of cases using AI can be like, oh, that's a pizza. And this is, you know, what the nutritional profile is to help you out. But tracking that information is cumbersome. It's not the greatest thing. So by using, you know, the CEM devices, you don't necessarily need to know all of the specifics of that food, but you do know how it's impacting you. You know, so I ate yogurt one day and it spiked up. The next day I put some protein powder in that yogurt and it, you know, made a difference in, in how it in, impacted my body. So again, looking forward to, you know, proliferation and, and CGM and, um, for non diabetic patients and what kind of impact it can make it on the world, all sorts of technologies in, in terms of, you know, training, um, you know, physical activity, you know, lactate thresholds and all sorts of things, which we won't get into, um, they're, they're really specific to, you know, athletes and, and things of that, or. You know, they're probably the top 1% of people in the world and, and these technologies are going to get them to be that, like that 0.1% of the world. Very useful if you're, you know, Olympic level, you know, athlete kind of thing. If you're the average Joe out there, you know, training, it's interesting, but it's not going to really add value, um, to, to your training experience. But yeah, the more and more, what was the other, uh, it's just so many thoughts are going through my head in, in terms of like this new technology. Um, you know, brainwave technology and understanding what's going on in your brave. And when you talk about alpha and beta waves and different things like that, to just be able to relax you, you know, so morning routine, it's good to sit there and, and meditate or pray, whatever works for you, but a calming moments, you know, right. take 10 minutes in the morning, it's a good practice. Well, there are technologies that can look at what's going on in your brain to see how you are relaxing. And then it sort of evolves to like, hey, can we do this without 
you were actually relaxing and just you know so fascinating what technology is, is going to be coming and what we can do with it absolutely now coming back to you know what you do currently and you've been doing it for a long time of course rj at this tender um how things change from the traditional let's say you know traditional healthcare systems like you know the emrs the ehrs and and these things now like are, are you seeing also from customizations perspective things moving directions as well and here i'm i'm you know what i'm interested to know uh, because when I was, you know, preparing, I've checked on the website. I've seen like, you know, like like you partner with some of the known big names in in that domain. So are you seeing these big guys, you know, usually following the trend, or are you seeing like more room for kind of uh, new startups, you know, that they are coming up with like more creative, more innovative solution that fit um, the digital health uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that is a great question, and it is a trend I've seen over the years, um, and it has probably made our lives a little more interesting um, from a, running a business perspective. But hospitals, health systems, large companies have definitely, I think of it as a shifting the risk. So where 20 years ago, you know, there was probably a lot more of, you know, this internal development, let's try this. and. It still definitely happens, you know, and, you know, we do plenty of business with plenty of different organizations. Um, and, you know, there's a huge market for, for what we do, you know, globally kind of thing, but more and more, I do see this shift to let's work with a startup organization, you know, so th that's, and I, I think of it as shifting the risk because that startup organization has now crafted the technology created that has done some testing kind of thing. And then you got to get into, you know, run a pilot test it and, you know, a health system um, in particular to see if it actually works. And, and so you have those partnerships and can run those pilot tests. Um, so, yeah, there, there definitely has been a shift over the last 20 years of I think, shifting that risk. More and more startups are being invited in, into, you know, healthcare systems um, to advance, you know, the science and, and capabilities of what people can do. Any anything um, you know that uh, excites you? Any have you seen any startup in in this domain that is really exciting to you now? There are so many startups out there. Um, it, it's it's interesting because healthcare is also particularly challenging. Um, most of our experiences here in in the US, we've done a, a few things over in the EU, but it, it's here with our private payer system. It's like always who's paying. Um, in, and how they, you know, so you have one entity that might be paying it, but they're not actually using it. It's another group of people that's using it. So it makes healthcare a little more challenging. Sales cycles are, are really long, even, you know, if you're that startup trying to get into an organization. So there's a lot of risk from, from that perspective. Um, just really excited to see what everybody's doing. Um, you talked about the wearables. One of the things that wearables are. Um, making possible is the idea of care at home mm -hmm. as populations around the world are getting older and older, you know, you know, if you, your parents are getting older, my parents are, are getting close to 80, you know, as they get older and they need a little more assistance, you know, do they want to go to a nursing home or an assisted living facility, or do they want to stay at home where they're comfortable, where they're happy, where they're familiar with the environment? They'll have a much better quality of life there in that environment. So using the wearables in what's you know, the, the term care at home is, is really coming in into its own. You know, how do we use the power of technology to let them stay at home, but understand, you know, what's going on with, you know, like passive technology, you know, put a camera, you know, in, in the room, that's a little invasive, you know, okay. It's like, Hey, we can watch you. We can look in on you, it gets a little invasive. We'll now start using passive sensors and just understand, hey, my mother got out of bed this morning. She opened up a cabinet. You know, I'm not sitting there watching her, but I am getting signals and using the power of AI to understand patterns of behavior over time. 
It's like, okay, here's what my mother does every morning. She wakes up at seven o'clock, gets out into the bed, brushes her teeth, starts the coffee machine, you know, turns on the TV. Well, all of a sudden those events don't happen. Signal, you know, Hey, call your, your care provider, your loved one. It's like, Hey, check in on your mother. You know, she's not following her usual pattern of behavior today. Hopefully there's a reason for that. But if there's not, you can intervene in that. So yeah, then I think in terms of areas, like broadly care at home, I think is, is a big up and coming area and using the power of wearables and technology and AI and like bringing all those things together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, RJ, like really we, we, you know, we, we talked a lot about many cool things today, uh, as we are almost close to the end, any advice you want to give to, you know, maybe, you know, younger generation that are now about to decide if they want to get into the, uh, healthcare digital technology sector. So, you know, a couple of words and then where people can find more about you and about the uh, extend. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I think, and I started, you know, our, our discussion today talking about th that understanding of technology and people and process. And one of the things at Esten that we really em emphasize is the idea of empathy, understanding the user. So anybody that's, you know, coming into the field, whether it's on the health side, the technology side, the intersection of those two things, there's so much potential, so much opportunity, but you first really need to understand your user. Um, there's so much information available. Like if you don't have diabetes, if you don't have congestive heart failure, you don't have multiple sclerosis, but you know, maybe a family member does and you want to help out in with that particular condition. There's so much information available, one on the internet, you know, videos to, to understand that, but talk to people, understand their, their situation to be able to develop the, the solutions. Um, sitting in your garage is not going to get you very far developing an effective healthcare solution. Uh, you really need to be out there and, and talking to the people. Um, so yeah, em empathy and under understanding the users, hugely important. Um, in any, any industry, but definitely healthcare. Um, how to find me, um, LinkedIn is, is by far the best, um, search me out on LinkedIn or, or extend our website, extend.com, E-S-T-E-N-D-A. Um, also later this year, I'm at the, uh, match going out to tech crunch, um, conference out in, in California. I think it's like the end of October, depending on when this goes, goes out. Um, but I'm also at the hit lab, uh, convention in New York city in the first week of December. Um, great organization talking about uh, all things digital health. So look forward to seeing everybody out there. Cool. Uh, again, RJ, thank you very much for, you know, this uh, very informative uh, episode today. You know, you uncovered a lot of things related to healthcare, digital uh, technology in general, especially when we discuss the AI, the wearables, the future also. So really these are like really helpful uh helpful i would say insights to to the audience and people who are interested in in that domain so thank you very much uh for sharing that with us you will find the links to uh, uh rj's linkedin and to the company in the show notes if you're listening to us on um any podcasting app of your favorite and if you are watching this on youtube you will be able also to see that in the description and this is the way i add my episodes usually uh, if you just discovered this episode now today and you discovered this podcast thank you for passing by i hope you enjoyed it if you did so please give us a thumb up subscribe and share it with your friends and colleagues and if you are one of the people who keep coming back thank you for doing so thank you for being loyal to the show i really appreciate all that and as i say always thank you very much for tuning in We'll be again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hit that subscribe button. Share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.